Hey, good morning, Anthony Creek. Let's all stand together. Hey, we get another opportunity to worship together, and we're going to get into the Word. Man, there's so much fear and anxiety all around the world today, but we know that we can trust in the Lord. He has a plan for us. He has a plan for this world. So let's sing that.
Lord, we sing that, but we sometimes feel we're stating the obvious. Lord, it's um, true how we need you more than we can even express. Um, Lord, without you, we can do nothing, but with you, all things become possible. Lord, we're so thankful that you're there for us when we need you the most, when then probably the greatest thing of the problem of our sin and the wages of sin, of death and hell, but how thankful we are that you meet our every need, especially that one, that you give us the way, the truth, and the life, salvation and forgiveness of sin, future and a hope with you. I pray, Lord, that we'd know just the glory of your plan for us, that you reach out and touch humanity and save us. Um, bless this time, sharpen our minds that we'd receive your word today, that it might bring forth good fruit in our lives and in your church. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, why don't you have a seat and make yourself comfy? And welcome, good to have you all here at this uh, Sunday morning, a nice, nice Sunday morning to get into the word. I uh, got a few announcements, then we'll get into the scriptures. Uh, the first announcement is, we have a fun event coming up. I wanted to give you a heads up on the Harvest Festival. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, when it comes to holidays, you know, most of them started somewhere in paganism. Uh, and, and then a lot of times the church was able to turn it around and make it more of a Christian thing. And that's kind of cool. Well, Halloween's the one that didn't really make that turn, if, if you know what I mean. So um, and if you want to do trick-or-treating and worship Satan, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, we we want to give your kids an alternative on the 31st of October. We, we're gonna do Harvest Festival. Um, we've been so blessed the last few years to uh, sort of hang out at Lee Farms and do all that over there. Uh, but we're, uh, they've been really nice to let us do that. But we're bringing it back, uh, home, home court advantage here at the, at the facility. We're gonna do the Harvest Festival here at church. So uh, it's gonna be October 31st, uh, three o'clock to 9 p.m. And it's a free event, but you need to, um, you need to get tickets if you're coming. You gotta get tickets because what we're gonna do is, because there's so many children and kids and families, we're gonna need to spread it out. Uh, and so the, the tickets actually have timestamps uh, on them and you'll be able to reserve those as we speak. You can go online, get your tickets, they're free. But if you don't have a ticket, you'll be left behind where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So <laughs> your children will not be happy if you don't get tickets. So um, make sure you get a ticket and it'll kind of tell you when we, we want to spread uh, the population out as much as we can. But 30 plus carnival games and, um, you know, uh, booths and bounce houses and live bluegrass music and food and a ton of candy and cavities and all that. It's going to be great. Uh, we, we want to encourage you if you want to dress up, dress up as something from the Bible, which if, if you can say, well, this is from the Bible and show us, then uh, you, you're good. Uh, that's the goal. You gotta, it's going to do that. Also, we need lots of volunteers. If you want to serve at this event, you know, helping with one of the booths or, you know, you're feeling dangerous, you want to do the balloon darts uh, or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, we'd love to have you help us out. It's going to be great. A good time. Friday night uh, is our prophecy update as we're getting ready to enter into October. Uh, so Friday night, we do that every first Friday of each month. Uh, we're gonna be here in the sanctuary. Um, uh, there's nothing really to talk about, but we'll, we'll be here anyway. Um, <laughs> so I sort of joke because if you watch any of the news, this week was a giant uh, week when it comes to things Bible prophecy, Israel. Um, if you don't know, uh, Netanyahu gave a speech at the United Nothing, I mean the United Nations, and um, and, you know, people didn't even think he'd show because they're so hostile toward Israel. You know, Israel, there's been um, more resolutions passed against Israel in the United Nations than all the other countries combined. Uh, they, they, there's a hatred for Israel from the United Nations. But Netanyahu went and spoke there on Friday and uh, basically said, We're gonna def we have the right to defend our country and we are going to defend it. And, you know, no more rockets from Hezbollah in the north. We're going to deal with that and uh, basically called out the world in a fiery speech to uh, their hypocrisy about the whole thing. Um, and then, you know, talk about a mic drop. After he said, you know, thank you, and he stepped down, at that very moment, um, F-16s dropped tons and tons of bombs in Beirut and um, took out the Hezbollah headquarter bunker. You know, they blew it up from the, you know, it's one of those bombs that go down and penetrate several layers of bunkers and then blows up. And it left a huge crater and they killed Hassan Nasrallah. If you know who he is, he's been the uh, Hezbollah leader for 32 uh, years. So like he, uh, and also, you know, he was there kind of behind the, uh, if, if you're old enough to remember the, um, our Marines that were killed in Beirut uh, in 2000, or what was that, 1982? 
Um, more than 200 of our servicemen killed by uh, uh, he and Nasrallah, you know, has American blood on his hands. So nobody's really sad. In fact, the Lebanese were celebrating in the street that Nasrallah was killed. Um, and so, uh, like, it's an amazing thing what the, you know, the Israelis have done fighting both in the north and the south, Gaza and uh, Hezbollah. Um, but, uh, but the next question is, what does that mean with Bible prophecy? And also, what, you know, right now, the Jews this weekend are hiding in bunkers because uh, all the uh, hostile nations, including Iran, are saying, you know, we're going to retaliate. And so it's very, very brutal over there. We'll be talking more about that stuff, uh, Prophecy Update, uh, this Friday night. You can join us live or live online. Either way, love to have you. Wednesday night, we continue our verse-by-verse study through the Bible, and I'd uh, love to have you join us there. Uh, uh, but we're going to be uh, finishing up, Lord willing, John chapter 20. So would you turn there with me as we take our text from our upcoming Wednesday night study? Um, but this really is kind of a, a part two of what we started last Sunday. Um, and the discussion is about the resurrection. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do part two of that. Last Sunday, we talked about what does the resurrection mean to us? Why does it matter? Why not just say, well, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross. But this whole resurrection thing, why is it even important? And I gave you seven reasons, uh, if you recall. Verification for who he is. Jesus is God who died on the cross. How do we know? Because he rose from the grave to prove it. Uh, it's also confirmation of his power to have life over death, power over death, um, confirmation, substantiation of his claims of, of what he's able to do. Um, that was all done when he rose from the grave, it substantiated his claims. And then number four, brought to us salvation uh, for anyone who would believe and accept the work of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, and then intercession. Uh, when Jesus rose from the grave, it says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And in the courtroom of heaven, he's your defense attorney. Even though you're guilty of sin, uh, we have a defense attorney who is our defender and he's the payment for our, our penalty, Jesus himself. So he intercedes for us, which brings number six on our list from last week, anticipation. Um, that we have the hope of heaven because of the resurrection, because he lives we get to live also. That's what the Bible tells us. Um, and then finally, protection uh, from death and hell, eternal death and hell. That's what the resurrection brings. Now, you might say, well, great, Brett. So the resurrection does all those things. What if I don't believe it actually even happened? Um, well, you would join a lot of uh, you know, college professors, pipe-puffing, cardigan, sweater-wearing professors say, oh, the historical Jesus never really died on the cross and never really actually existed. And there's a lot of people that try to make these uh, sort of spectacular claims. But um, I want to show you this week the proof positive, not only that Jesus existed, but that he died and that he rose from the grave. It's one of the most provable historical facts in the history of the world. If there's anything that's more provable, I would challenge you to show me something that happened 2,000 years ago that has more evidence than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and yet people are still hesitant to believe, which is shocking to me. But let's just kind of brush up where we are in our text. John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying but he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went, he then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, uh, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. This is the beginning of the disciples starting to understand what was going on here, that Jesus's body was no longer there. 
evidence really number one um, about um, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. See, there's several layers of evidence. I'd like to give you biblical evidence. I'd also like to talk about circumstantial evidence, but also historical evidence. Um, first of all, biblical evidence. If you just take the Bible and the narrative, the story itself, it's pretty airtight evidence of something that actually happened. Um, we'll talk about the reliability of the Bible in a minute, but, um, but right, right here in this story, uh, we take it right out of the gate. Uh, they showed up to the tomb and there was no body there. There was, uh, Jesus was gone. Um, and from this point on, the disciples would start to, we'd see a major change in the disciples. Um, and, and Jesus will, will appear to them in chapter 20. Uh, all the disciples would see Jesus in his resurrected form. And from that day forward, they would be a different bunch of guys, uh, filled with the spirit, boldly proclaiming Jesus and with reckless abandon, not afraid of anybody. I like, it's an amazing thing that happens to these guys after they see the resurrection of Jesus. Um, uh, of all the things we read about in history, like I've said, there's no greater documented, uh, talked about, mentioned, believed on, massive fact than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first part we look at is biblical evidence. Do you remember um, Jesus started by telling everybody, this is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna go to Jerusalem and they're gonna kill me. Even one passage says, they're, you know, specifically I'm gonna be crucified, which is very unlikely for a Jew in Jerusalem in those days because the normal sto stoning would have been the normal way of execution. But um, like, for example, you know, here where uh, Mark chapter eight, verse 31, Jesus was, teaching his disciples. He began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, those that are critical of the Bible or cynical about Christianity or not believers, there's all kinds of contentions they have with um, the story of the resurrection. Um, you know, let's just talk about a few of them. Contention number one. Uh, there's a lot of people that claim, well, Jesus never really died. Um, there's actually people, large people groups that believe that all of Islam believes that Jesus hung on a cross, but he didn't die. He, um, well, there's a fancy word uh, scholars call swooning. He swooned. What does it mean to swoon? Um, well, swooning is where you, they thought you were dead, but you weren't completely dead. And uh, they put him in the tomb. Uh, and then after three days, he was feeling a lot more peppy and, and woke up and peppy enough to uh, unwrap himself of the grave clothes, roll the two-ton stone away, fight the Roman guards and come out and say to the disciples, I've, ar I've risen. Now, by the way, if you have faith to believe that, you have way more faith than I have ever had. That's so wacko. Like that's so ridiculous to believe that uh, Jesus escaped the guarded tomb and after being, you know, it's not just that he was nailed and whipped with a flagellum, but he had a spear thrust in his side um, and water and blood came gushing out of his side. And the reason the Romans stuck him with the spear was to make sure he was dead. Did the Romans know what dead was? Those Roman soldiers were experts on death. That, that was their job description, kill people. That was their job. And they were good at it. And they made the suffering of crosses of crucifixion an art form. So when they came to break the legs of the guys, because they knew it was time to take them off and bury them, um, they would break the legs because a uh, person, we've gone through this, you can't breathe if you're hanging on a cross um, and your legs aren't bent where you can stand up on them. There's a whole system the Romans had. So when they wanted it to be over, break the legs and they'd suffocate to death. But the, the biblical historical um, the narrative is that when they came to Jesus, he'd already died. But just to make sure, they stuck a spear in his side. And if he was faking or like uh, pretending to be dead, uh, it would have been evident at that point when you stick a spear in someone's side. Um, and then blood and water gushes out. If you're a forensic medicine expert, you, uh, th those, there's people who have deduced how Jesus actually died because of the stress of the cross. Um, what happened, they believe, is his heart literally burst from the stress. And that's why the mixture of blood and water coming out of the side, like there's some interesting science uh, that anticipates how Jesus actually died. What was the forensics of that? But um, the Muslims believe Jesus just swooned, um, passed off the cross, didn't die, and basically came and said, I'm still alive. And uh, they believe he's just a prophet. By the way, Christian science, if you know what that is, 
Um, they, they believe Jesus uh, didn't really die on the cross. Uh, and by the way, if you're wondering, Christian science, it's neither Christian nor is it science. It's like grape nuts. There's no grapes and there's no nuts. Um, it's the same thing, if you know what I'm talking about. But uh, Christians believe in one fundamental thing, and we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and then he rose from the grave. That is an essential part of our faith. Even the earliest of creeds, some people try to make the argument, well, the resurrection of Jesus was an invention of the third century. You know, after Constantine, they started acting like Jesus rose from the grave. That's a ridiculous argument. If you read the Bible that is easily dated, you know that they were talking about the resurrection, even Paul the apostle and the stories of the gospel were talking about the resurrection, re resurrected Jesus. Um, there was an invention under the third century. They're relying on, uh, back in the, like 1917, there was a bunch of scholarly so-called um, uh, theologians that were making the argument that the gospels were a forgery or, or at least dated much later than what we thought, like by several hundred years. Um, and that was a contention for a long time. That has uh, easily been proven wrong um, in so many ways, it's embarrassing. And yet there's still people out there uh, pushing that lie that the gospels were very um, much later dated. But no, the, the gospel writers, um, you know, were actually there uh, and saw an eyewitness account of the whole story and they wrote about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so the earliest creed was one that Paul uh, actually gave us in 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, if you know, when you look for certain chapters of the Bible, if you say, where's the love chapter in the Bible? A lot of people say 1 Corinthians 13. Where's the chapter on marriage in the Bible? A lot of people say Ephesians chapter five. Like there's famous chapters that deal with things. Well, if you wanna know what the most important, perhaps chapter on the resurrection, it's not John 20 as much, as, as great as that's the story, but it's 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul lays out the detail and the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He starts though with the creed of the early church. He says this, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you wanna know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, here it is in a nutshell, right here. If you go downtown Portland in a Pioneer Square and you say, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? You'll hear all kinds of crazy things. You might even hear some crazy things from this group here. I hope not. If you've been at Aether Creek long enough, the gospel is not going to church. The gospel is not being a perfect person or carrying a big Bible. The gospel is not Billy Graham crusade. Uh, it's not that. The gospel is actually Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, uh, was buried, and on the third day rose again according to the scriptures. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, now, uh, Paul goes on after this in verse uh, five of the same chapter, and he says, and, and that he, Jesus, was seen after he rose from the grave, seen of Cephas, which is another name for Peter, then of the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are falling asleep. In other words, of the 500, by the time Paul the apostle rolls around, which he's later than the other disciples, um, some of those people that saw eyewitness account of the 500, some are already dead because time has gone by. Verse seven, after that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Question, where did Paul the apostle? Remember, he, he wasn't even a Christian. He was a hater of Christians. He went around persecuting the church and Christians and killing them and imprisoning them. Um, when did Paul the apostle see a resurrected Jesus? Anybody? Yeah, the road to Damascus. He was going to Damascus to hunt down Christians. He hated Christians, didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When suddenly the Lord knocks him off his horse as he's going to, to Damascus and now he's laying on the ground blinded and he hears a voice from heaven and his name was Saul before it was Paul. And the voice says, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who art thou, Lord? I think he kind of knew who it was. Um, and he says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute. Um, Jesus, uh, it's like, this is where Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And it would be at that point, Paul would realize that Jesus was 
the one who died on the cross and rose from the grave and he becomes a Christian. Now, when he goes um, to Antioch, and can you imagine being a Christian church back in those days? And like this guy's like Adolf Hitler uh, who hates Christians and wants to kill you, shows up at your church on a Sunday morning. It's like, I'm a Christian now. You're like, sure you are. It's like, where's the deacons? Haul this guy out. We're gonna have you meet Jesus this morning. Like, like it'd be a little different thing uh, if you said, but Paul actually became a Christian and, um, and he really did meet Jesus. And that's what this is talking about. What's amazing about this is this is a hostile source. Paul, who hated Christians and didn't believe, now he's a, a firm believer. And Paul would go down the rest of his life serving Christ, even to where Nero would behead him in Rome because he was such a fervent believer in Christ. This is a guy who was totally convinced about a resurrected Jesus Christ. So um, this is what the Bible says. He was, he was you know, crucified on the cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave. That contention, he didn't really die. That's a very weak argument. Uh, well, contention number two, Pastor Brett, I believe that all those 500 people, 500 brethren that saw him at once there in verse eight, um, they were all hallucinating. Have you heard the hallucination theory? Were they all eating mushrooms or something? Um, no. Uh, by, by the way, hallucinations, if you know uh, sociology and psychology, hallucinations don't happen in large groups seeing exactly the same thing. Um, that's not really a, a reality. Um, these are people that believed that they saw um, Jesus resurrected. And, um, and also we'll see why that's, that's so important to know um, that it, it had to be true. And there's a reason we can, we can see that. I'll show you that in a second. Um, but there's those who say, no, they were hallucinating. They didn't really uh, see what they were seeing. They were all, you know, uh, uh, you know making it up maybe. Um, the problem is that's not what happened. They saw with their eyes and were willing to die for what they saw. And they weren't wanting to denounce or renounce their faith in Christ. Um, this is important. Uh, eyewitness accounts. If you've got a, um, a courtroom and you've got a, a trial and you have one eyewitness, that's gonna help your case a lot. If you have two eyewitnesses, man, you're getting to be airtight. But if you have 500 eyewitnesses, you've got an open and shut case. That's the case we have with the resurrection. Hundreds of people saw Jesus after he died, was buried and rose from the grave. And all of those people would go down even to their own death, unwilling to deny what they believed. Um, the biblical evidence is really clear just in and of itself. It takes more faith to believe that the, that the resurrection didn't happen than to actually believe that it did happen. Um, the evidence is, is clear. Um, one of the, the contentions people, I've heard this one. Well, then when they went to the tomb to see Jesus that morning, they just got the wrong tomb. The old wrong tomb theory. Have you heard that one? That disciples and Mary, they just got the wrong address. Oh, it's not that tomb. But how would you not know this? If you know the biblical account, biblical evidence, um, we know exactly whose tomb it was, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a wealthy man who uh, sort of leased the tomb out for the weekend for Jesus, uh, if you know how the story goes, because he rose from the grave. Um, but, uh, but it would have been a fancy tomb. The Bible says it was a garden tomb. It was a wealthy man's tomb. Not only that, they wouldn't have mis, um, you know, uh, understood where it was because you remember the Roman soldiers were there guarding the tomb that morning. Um, we also know they put a Roman seal over the tomb. It would have been undeniable which tomb was the tomb of Jesus. To believe that they just accidentally went to the wrong place is a weak argument. Um, but it was marked with a Roman seal and posted with guards. Um, well, well, okay, Brett, I believe that the disciples went and stole the body away to, to act like, like Jesus rose from the grave. Okay, so we saw Peter with a sword there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you think Peter and the disciples were good enough to take on? You gotta understand when Pontius Pilate puts his Roman guard there, those are the SEAL Team Six guys. Those are the Roman guards that take their job very seriously. And you think the disciples fought those guys and stole the, uh, well, maybe, maybe they didn't fight them, but maybe the, the Roman guards were sleeping on the job. One of the things I've taken a lot of time studying myself, um, just because it's interesting to me, is uh, Roman law and order and military. It's a fascinating study. How did the Romans, you know, when they conquered much of the world, you know, Julius Caesar and all the wars of, of Rome and stuff, 
why would the Roman soldiers even fight for other people's battles and stuff? Well, it had to do with fear. It was, it was really driven by fear. Um, and if you were derelict in your duties as a Roman soldier, you would be dead. It was just that simple. There's actually uh, accounts you can read about. Like one guy didn't do his job as a Roman soldier. And so they called him out of the group, uh, um, the you know, legion of soldiers, and they stripped him down naked, piled his clothes by the, his feet, poured kerosene all over the clothes and his body and lit him on fire. And said, if you, if you don't do your job as a Roman soldier, you'll be next. That was the way they rolled. They didn't give you a toothbrush where you went and cleaned the latrines uh, or whatever. Uh, like in today's army, uh, they, they did it kind of like, you're dead if you don't do your job. You really think a whole group of Roman soldiers would be sawn logs, sleeping on the job on something that Pontius Pilate, the, the leader of the Roman uh, region there, uh, put them up to this job? Like that, really? You believe the disciples rolled a two-ton stone away without waking them up and stealing the body? Again, fantasy. You got more faith than I have, if you believe that one. What's even more interesting about the biblical evidence is the doubters even eventually would believe, like Thomas. Remember in the later part of this chapter, we're gonna see it on Wednesday night, where Thomas, he says, he walks into the room with the disciples and they said, we saw Jesus. He said, no, you didn't. And he says, I will not believe that Jesus rose from the grave unless... I can put my finger in the hole in his hands and I can thrust my fist in the hole that they put in his side. Then I'll believe, but I will not believe. Well, a few days later, Jesus shows up in that same room and this time Thomas is there. And Thomas, Jesus walks up to Thomas and he says, Thomas, get your finger out. Put, the, put it in my hole in my hands. Put your fist in my side. And he said, Thomas, it's better for you to have believed without seeing. Blessed are those that believe without seeing. And Thomas falls down at Jesus' feet and says something that's kind of amazing. He, he says, my Lord and my God. By the way, if Jesus wasn't God, would he have allowed that? Would Jesus have allowed Thomas to fall down and call him my Lord and my God? Um, he did allow that because Jesus is God. We've talked about that last week. And he proved that when he rose from the grave. But Thomas would, even a critical, cynical doubter was like, no way, I will not believe it unless I see it. And he saw it. And he believed. Unlikely evidence. Like if you're gonna write the story, if you're trying to build a lie about your guru or your religious leader that rose from the grave, um, how would you make the narrative? If you're a gospel writer, what would you write? Well, there's some things you wouldn't write. One of the great evidences is one we as Americans would miss because uh, culturally we miss something huge. And it's, it's the issue of the women around the resurrection. Question, what were women thought of in the first century? Were they, uh, was women's lib alive and well back in those days? Um, uh, by the way, uh, one of the things I, I challenge all the women of these women's studies of colleges and universities, study where the gospel of Jesus Christ has been received in the world. I'll show you the most liberated women in the world. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ has been rejected, like most of the Islamic world and Sharia law world, I'll show you women, just like the women back in the first century who are oppressed, beaten, killed if they don't wear the right thing, like that poor woman that didn't wear the hijab. And so she was hung uh, from a crane in, in Iran just a, a while back. Um, like that, that's the world. That, women were, were despised and hated. But what's even more interesting is we know that a woman's testimony in the first century was in their mind, worthless. Uh, how do you know that? But were you there? No, but... There's writings of those who were. One of those writings is a little uh, work called the Mishnah. Does, do you guys know what the Mishnah was? Uh, the Mishnah is uh, basically a collection of exegetical material um, that basically embodies the whole oral tradition of Jewish world and thought. Um, kind of like uh, the Jewish law. It's like a commentary on the Jewish law from Moses. That's the Old Testament, the, the, but they, they sort of made a commentary on the, the Mosaic law. And, and this, the book, the Mishnah, forms the first part of the Talmud for you guys that know about these things. But what's important for you to know today is this is a bunch of Jewish writers that basically sum up the way they believed and what they thought in the first century. And it's kind of shocking. For example, in the Mishnah, uh, on their Rosh Hashanah, uh, chapter one, verse eight, let me read to you. This is uh, basically who is fit to give testimony in a court of law. 
Well, this is what the Mishnah says. The following are unfit to give testimony in a court of law as they are considered thieves and robbers. One who plays with dice or other games of chance for money. So if you're a gambler, a known gambler, they won't let you uh, give testimony in a court of law. Um, one uh, who uh, lends money with interest. Of course, if you know the Jewish law, you're not supposed to lend money with interest. That was the Mosaic law. Those who race pigeons, which you all do after church, I'm sure you're gonna go race some <laughs> pigeons. Uh, I guess there was like, they were placing wagers on uh, pigeon races. Like there was a thing. Uh, if you do that, you're not trustworthy. Um, uh, I think that's kind of funny. But anyway, those who are merchants who deal in produce on the sabbatical year, you may eat the fruit, but you may not be um, letting the fruit be an object of commerce. Uh, and then also slaves. So this is a list. Now you say, okay, Brett, that's great. That doesn't involve women. But here's where, this just takes the cake. Wait till you hear the way they say this. Again, this is translated from ancient languages, so it sounds a little weird. But um, I'm gonna tell you. So the, the, this list of all these gamblers and robbers and thieves and people who don't observe the sabbatical year and stuff. Um, uh, but they said, here's the general principle of who is uh, uh, not fit to give testimony. Any testimony for which a woman, a woman is unfit. These two are unfit. Did you hear what they just said? They're basically saying um, all these bad people, you know, basically um, are in the category of a woman. The, that, that's just, a, a, it's already accepted that a woman's testimony in a court of law is unacceptable. And so who else fits in the woman category? Robbers, thieves, uh, gamblers, and stuff like that. And then it goes on. Although in certain cases, a woman's testimony will be accepted, for example, to testify of the death of her husband. So basically, the only time you listen to a woman is if she runs out of the house, my husband just died. You know, well, you might want to believe her on that one. Brett, why are you saying this? Uh, I'm saying this because women were despised in those days. And yet, if you're writing a narrative and you want to make people believe it, the last thing you do is have women be the centerpiece of the whole resurrection story. Do you understand how unlikely that would be? Like that, that it's, it, it, you know, might weaken your case and yet God sees fit to say, watch, watch what I'm gonna do. You see, that's where I just love the story of the resurrection. Women are the only ones who seem to know what's going on in the story. The disciples are the ones who are kind of clueless, but it's the women. And God says, watch this. I'm gonna have women be the testimony. And you know, the women, uh, they're the first ones that showed up at the cross, the last ones to leave. They're the first one that showed up at the tomb. The women are the first one that actually saw the resurrected Jesus, if you read the biblical narrative. Um, the reason I bring that up is because um, if you're trying to make up a lie in the first century, you probably wouldn't make women the centerpiece of the testimony of a resurrected Jesus, which to me contributes to its reality. We could go on on some of the unlikely evidences, but the biblical evidence is alarmingly solid. We even see in the biblical evidence how Jesus' enemies, like Paul, accepted Christ, but, um, but also uh, people like James and Jude. Who are James and Jude? Well, if you remember, James and Jude were the half-brothers of Jesus. If you know someone for real, it's probably your brother and sister because you grew up with them. You know, you're, you know, if your brother came up to you or your sister, you guys have siblings and said, I am God in the flesh. You'd say, no, you're pretty much Satan because you know your brother and sister. You knew what a, you know, they're, they kicked you under the table at dinner and all that stuff. But, but isn't it amazing? When did James and Jude, the half brothers, I say half brothers because Jesus was born of a virgin, um, and by the way, for those of you who are raised in the Catholic tradition, no, Mary is not a perpetual virgin as they claim. She actually had other children. The Bible tells us that. But James and Jude, when did they accept Jesus to be the Messiah, God in the flesh? When they saw him risen from the grave, they believed. And they wrote two of the books of the Bible, James and Jude, uh, because they were strong believers. How strong believers were they? Well, when James was put on the line by the Romans and said, say Caesar is Lord, but James would not because he knew Jesus was the resurrected Lord. He was unwilling to say Caesar is Lord. So they said, if you do not say Caesar is Lord, we will cut you in half with a wooden saw. And he would not do it. And so they did. They cut James in half lengthwise with a wooden saw. That's the story of James. 
Don't you think, here's the brother of Jesus. Don't you think if there was ever a guy say, no, nah, he, he was a charlatan, he was a fake, he was a phony. Don't you think he would say at that point, Caesar is Lord, whatever. Um, but James was so convinced. This is an unlikely source of someone to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, his brother from his house growing up. Um, not only that, other unlikely sources of belief, Romans and the Jews themselves. Uh, talk about a hostile source of belief. Um, don't you understand? The Romans, were, you know, when Jesus died, the Jews came to Pilate and said, hey, he said he's gonna raise from the dead or something. So put the Roman guards there. And so the Roman, you know, Pilate said, okay, I'll give you a guard, seal the tomb, make it sure. And, um, and so they're all happy. But suddenly Jesus is gone. That's a problem for the Romans, for the Jews. Because the last thing Rome wants is this narrative that some king of the Jews rose from the grave. Um, that's a threat to the Roman Empire. The last thing the Jewish Sanhedrin and the religious leaders want is the word to get out that they killed the guy who rose from the grave. But do you understand, if you're one who doesn't really um, understand like the, the details of the story, think about it for a second. All they would have had to do is produce a dead body. All they would have had to do is say, see, they said he rose from the grave, but here's his body, but they were unable to. Um, if they wanted to snuff out Christianity uh, and you know kill it while it's still in its cradle there in Jerusalem, they could have done that if they produced the body, but they couldn't. You know what's amazing about that is the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. If you kind of know the history of Rome, um, they imploded from the inside out largely, but largely due to Christianity. It was 310, you know, around there where Constantine sort of seized the cross and, um, you know, AD 310. Uh, and then about 100 years after that, Christianity is now the religion of Rome. It took over the whole Roman Empire, which is kind of an amazing thing. Uh, a theologian, Dr. Paul Meyer, um, calls this positive evidence from a hostile source, um, which he, he argues is the strongest type of historical evidence what do you mean strongest type of historical evidence? Well, he says, if a source admits a fact decidedly, not in its favor, then the fact is genuine. In other words, if you hear something that doesn't really sound good for like the Roman empire, but they're still report, reporting it as having happened, um, then it's probably a, a, a genuine fact. And they use that as a measurement for true or false. Which brings us to kind of that second tier, not only biblical evidence, but also circumstantial evidence. You say, well, what if we don't care about circumstantial evidence? Well, I think we should care about it um, because there, it is evidence in some ways. I'd like to uh, talk to you about that. For example, if the resurrection was false, how do you explain the disciples and the 500 people, all of them dying all the brutal deaths? Wouldn't just one of them cracked? and said, okay, it was a joke. We're creating a new religion and, um, and we were just making it up. He really didn't raise from the dead. And uh, wouldn't one of them said, no, nah. like, like I'm surprised that more of them didn't say, yeah, we give up because um, even if Jesus did rise from the dead, I, I'd be like, I'll just say Caesar is Lord or whatever. And then say, I'm sorry later. Like, isn't it amazing that nobody did that? Read Fox's book of martyrs. It's a shocking thing that the early Christians who saw Jesus, they were not gonna lie and say Jesus did not rise from the grave. How do you explain the brutal death of Peter who was hung upside down on a cross like Jesus, only upside down? Or Thomas who was stuck through with a spear while he was preaching? If it was a joke or fabricated, um, they wouldn't have died those brutal deaths of martyrdom. Number two, how do you explain Motive, what was their motive to propagate a lie? If all those 500 that we read about and the disciples, if they were promoting a lie, what's in it for them? What was their motive? Because really they got nothing out of it other than death. In fact, torturous, brutal deaths. They all died except for John. And John uh, was there by Domitian. Domitian made the rule that John would be boiled in a pot of oil. So in Ephesus, they took John, stuck him in a boiling pot of oil. But somehow God miraculously preserved John and he didn't die. And they would exile him on the island of Patmos. But, but all the other disciples died horrible, torturous deaths. How do you explain their motive? Why would they pr promote a lie? And uh, what was in it for them? The answer is nothing. Unless it was true 
and Jesus was their savior for all eternity, that'd be the only motive that they would say, we're willing to die for that cause. How do you explain circumstantial evidence like the growth of Christianity throughout the whole world? Um, think about it for a second. Um, he's just some little dude from Galilee, Nazareth, um, a carpenter's son, and he goes into Jerusalem and claims to be uh, God, and they kill him on a cross. Um, how do you explain? Be because if that was just the thing, he would have been erased in history. If that's where it ended, it would have been the end of the discussion. But what we actually see is the whole world is turned upside down. We even changed our dating system based on Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. We changed our dating system. We suddenly saw the change uh, of, of so much in the world. The disciples, um, they started preaching the gospel, even as Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the, the gospel spread like wildfire. Why? Because they were passionate and they knew that Jesus had risen from the grave. Um, you know, in the upper room that day in Acts chapter two, they had 120 people. By the reign of Constantine in 310 AD, um, most of the Roman empire was Christian. Today, there's more than two and a half billion people that believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave. How is it that some little dude from Galilee changed the whole world? I'll tell you, the only reason it's gone like it has is because Jesus did what he said he would do. He claimed, if you destroy this body, three days later, I'll raise it up from the grave. And, and he said, this is the one sign I'm gonna show you. Had he not done that, Christianity would have been suffocated right out of the grave. But instead, Christianity was huge and spread in the world like wildfire because it was true. More circumstantial evidence that the, the, the gospel spread. And here we are, a bunch of Portlanders sitting in a room, worshiping Jesus, reading the Bible. Um, it, it, you know, if, if you're a doubter, one thing I would just say is um, you'll meet people in this room that, that you know, they're not delusional, not all of them. <laughs> they're not all crazy. We have some great intellectuals in this. In fact, some of the greatest intellectuals in history were believer in history that were believers that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the grave. And and those are not dumb people. But when they chose to believe and accept the work of Jesus, there was something that happened in their lives that actually was changing them. There was power. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, man, I, I met Jesus. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not a Christian, you do not know what we're talking about. You do not have a relationship with a risen Jesus Christ. Oh, but that's circumstantial evidence. Yeah, but billions and billions of people who know Jesus Christ personally, are you sure you wanna just blow this off as some delusional thinking of a resurrected Jesus? even though you have that? Well, it's not just circumstantial. In fact, there's much historical evidence of a risen Jesus Christ um, outside of the Bible. You don't even have to, I mean, the Bible itself, I talked about biblical evidence and we have plenty of that. And you might say, Brett, well, what if I don't believe in the Bible? That's where you need to do your homework. Uh, I know the pipe puffing, cardigan sweater wearing guys, and the Bible's full of contradictions and errors and stuff. And, and the atheist, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trolls out there online, you know, chopping away at people on their social media about the Bible's this and the Bible's that, and God is an ethnic cleanser of people. And I, all those dumb arguments, you'll, you'll see people talk about them. But there's a reason why those, that small fringe group still stays small and fringe, because the reality is the Bible does not have contradictions and God has a perfect plan, and all those questions that are raised have easy answers. Um, it withstands the test of time. The Bible that you have in your hand right now is still the New York Times number one bestseller every week. They just took it off the list because they got tired of putting it up there. You know, New York Times, not real fans of the Bible. It's embarrassing for them to put the Bible at the top of the list every week. So they just took it off because everybody else knows, well, the Bible is still the bestseller every week. Why is that? It's because this book is more than just a book of literature. It's got God's fingerprints all over it. We see a supernatural nature of this book. Um, we could talk about its accuracy archeologically. You'd think there'd be one archeological dig that's just, well, Bible got it wrong. We, we might as well pack it up and go home because the Bible is inaccurate. Not one. In fact, over the centuries, professors, 
professing themselves to be wise. We know that, my, like, I, I've got my favorites I, I'd share with you. Like, uh, but one of my favorites was reading the old guys in the 1940s and 50s. They were saying, we know there was no place called the Plains of Dura that we read about in the book of Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar sets up his statue and makes people worship. We know there was never a place in the world called the Plains of Dura. And they said it so emphatically, right up in about 1968 when they were digging archeologically in Iraq and they found not only the place called the Plains of Dura and a plaque that said it, but they found what they believed to be the, perhaps the very foundation where Nebuchadnezzar put the statue itself. Um, and the Bible just continues to prove the skeptics, the cynics wrong. Um, you know, when Jesus was riding in with the donkey in Jerusalem and people were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember the Pharisees say, tell these guys, Jesus, tell these guys to stop, you know, saying this. And Jesus said, if these guys don't say it, the rocks will even start to cry out. Uh, I'd like to see that rock concert. The Rolling Stones, no, not that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know what? The rocks are crying out right now. Archaeologically, the rocks, the more they dig archaeologically, the more it proves that this book is accurate archaeologically. What about prophetically? Oh, but other people have written prophecy like Nostradamus. Yeah, 35% accurate was Nostradamus. What about George Orwell, 1984? He was pretty accurate. 35% accurate. Well, you got to give those guys credit. That's pretty good prediction. But it's not prophecy because it's not 100%. Everything the Bible has given us, which has given us thousands of prophecies of what's gonna happen in the world and in the future, it's all 100% accurate thus far. And it's only proving itself to be more and more accurate as time goes by. This book is supernatural. It's not just some work of literature. And if you believe your pipe puffing, uh, cardigan sweater wearing uh, professors that the Bible's wrong and full of uh, errors, you really wanna stake your eternal destination on those dudes? They're the same ones saying all kinds of wacko stuff that there are, that men are actually women and women are men. And they're like, oh, like they're the same people. Do you really want to state your eternal state on, on these uh, so-called academics when really the Bible has withstood centuries of scrutiny? I mean, the historical evidence is amazing. In fact, if you go outside of the Bible, one of the great uh, evidence is a guy by the name of Josephus. You hear me talk about him a lot because he's a major historical figure, lived from AD 37 to 100. Um, and he was a first century historian, but that's not really a great description of him, the historian part, even though he was. Um, he was captured by the Romans when he was young, but he was brilliant and it was, he was a scribe. He knew how to write really well and was articulate. Um, so they hired him as a scribe to write down current events and what he saw with his eyes. Um, and he hung out with the important Romans of the time in that part of the world. He was also an interpreter for the Roman government, Josephus. Um, so he wrote volumes of stuff uh, because he was at the, the pinnacle of all the major things that happened. For example, maybe you guys know the history of Titus Longimaeus in AD 70 when he, they marched into Jerusalem and crushed Jerusalem and killed tens of thousands of Jews. Um, guess who was riding on his horse right next to Titus Longimaeus? Josephus was there recording everything that he saw. And as the centuries have gone by, it's been shocking to see how accurate Josephus actually was about his writings. The reason I bring this up is he's not a Christian. Um, he's, a, he's sort of like a slave working for the Romans, but they, they used him to record at what you can now, the antiquities of the Jews and the, uh, the works of Josephus, volumes of writings. Um, not easy reading. I'll just give you a heads up. If you order it on Amazon, you're like, oh, Brett said, I'm gonna read. Good luck with that. It's, it's a lot. But, but let me read you a section that is interesting. You might think he sounds like a Christian, but what he is, he's describing a sect called Christians and what they believed. Check this out. Um, he says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, uh, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many Gentiles, which you understand that's a giant. There were never Jews and Gentiles being grouped together uh, in anything until Christianity. So he's making that observation. Um, he was Christ. You say, well, Brett, he's saying he's Christ. What he's saying is he's the Messiah of the Jews. That's what he's saying. 
And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these uh, and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to this day. He's marveling that Christianity wasn't rubbed out, especially as the Romans were conquering uh, uh, Jerusalem and, and eventually killing Jews and Christians. He says, it's an amazing thing that they're not extinct yet, but they, they are following this Jesus who they, they say is the Messiah of the Jews and that he rose from the grave. This is a guy in the first century. Do you see why the dumb arguments of people saying, well, the resurrection of Jesus is an invention of someone in the third century? No. Josephus wrote about it. He's not even a Bible-believing Christian. Wrote about the, the belief of the Christians of the first century. It's only even, um, you know, a, a historical evidence. Is, I could go on and on. This guy, uh, Sextus Julius Africanus, um, was uh, another historian of the second century. Um, the reason this guy's important, if, if you're interested, you look in book 18 of his writings, where he talks about a very specific time and date where the sun was darkened over all the earth. And, and, it, and it wasn't during a time of an eclipse. And he writes about this mysterious darkening of the sun that just so happens to correlate perfectly with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you remember, the earth was darkened, the Bible tells us in the biblical narrative. This is a guy that doesn't know anything about that. But he's writing about a darkened sun that happens to co uh, coexist with the time of Jesus. How, how about this guy, Pliny the Younger, uh, AD 61 to 113 was this guy. He was a character, uh, kind of a bad guy. Um, he was not a Christian, but he was an enforcer and a reporter to the emperor Trajan. And if you know the Roman emperor Trajan, he was a scary dude. Like he hated Christians, killed them in horrific ways. And Pliny was his sort of enforcer. He became the governor of Bithynia and also of Pontus, which is now in modern day Turkey. Uh, this guy's an interesting guy in history. But um, he had many recorded exchanges where he wrote letters to Trajan and they went back and forth. But in those letters to Trajan and Pliny the Younger, there's all kinds of interesting historical things. But this is one of them. This is one of the writings uh, that comes from the first century. He writes to the Trajan, he says, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. They asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error, remember, he, they hate Christians, they wanna kill them. Um, he said, is that they are accustomed to meet on a fixed day, which we know as Sunday, uh, they were meeting, first day of the week, and they'd start before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime or commit fraud or theft or adultery or falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return to trust when called upon to do so. In other words, they're actually nice people that don't do anything wrong. But when they have their services, when the service is over, it's their custom to assemble again and partake of food. I love that. That's an awesome part of history. Actually, we know about that. Um, the history writes that the church, they did what they called love feasts. Sounds very hippie, you know, like let's do love feasts, you know. Um, but um, they did, they ate meals after church, um, which is really cool. But um, he said, this is funny. He says, but they only eat ordinary and innocent food. What is innocent food? Gluten-free, fat-free, I don't know. Uh, that's not, I don't like innocent food, but... Um, <laughs> Um, the idea, I think, is plenty saying they didn't have enough money to eat sumptuously. They ate very basic food is the idea. Um, but this, he's talking about the church. Now listen to this. This is where it gets kind of sad. He said, even with this, they affirmed that they had, um, they, they ceased to do after my edict. Now you say, what was plenty of the younger's edict? It was to say, Caesar is Lord. That was the edict. And if you had any allegiance to any other, you would be killed on the spot. And these Christians refuse to say, Caesar, well, that's what he's talking about. He says, they refuse to do after my edict by which in accordance with your instructions, I had forbidden any political associations. Accordingly, I judged all the more necessary to find out what was the truth of these Christians by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved and excessive superstition. Isn't that sad? 
This guy, Pliny the Younger, found in the early church after their love feasts and the church doing their thing, found these two young slaves that were women deaconesses. Romans 16 tells us there were women deaconesses there in the early church. He finds these two young women, tortures them to death to try to find out what their real story was. And he says, all I found was this wacko superstition about a risen Jesus. You say, well, Brent, what does that do? It just tells us, here's a guy again in the first century talking about the church and what they believed and that they were willing to go down believing that Jesus is Lord because he rose from the grave. This is historical evidence. And, and I could give you hundreds of these that have been written by ancient writings. So your college professors that are saying, oh, Christianity is an invention of the fourth century or the fifth century, or they never really believed Jesus rose from the grave. They have not done their biblical work for sure, but they haven't even done their secular godless wacko work because it's all throughout history recorded that these Christians believe that Jesus rose from the grave. You know, um, how does the secular world handle the Christian of Jesus, the issue of the resurrected body? They try to make up, you know, disciples stole the body or he swooned or all these things we talked about. But, you know, it, it takes more faith to believe all that than just to believe the narrative itself that Jesus Christ did in fact die on the cross and rose from the grave, um, thereby doing what he said he would do, forgiving us of our sins, giving us hope of heaven. If you're a skeptic um, and you're still arguing the facts about the cross and all this stuff, can I just tell you, you, you better make sure you're on the right side of this one. Because um, there's only one way to heaven and that's to a resurrected Jesus. The Bible makes that clear. Um, he died for the sins of the whole world. And if you accept and receive that, the Bible says you'll be saved. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, uh, and it says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God has set forth to be a propitiation. The word propitiation means payment for your sin, your penalty through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. You know, later on, Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. None of this would be true if Jesus didn't raise it from the dead, but because it's one of the most provable facts in history, talked about, documented, believed on, life-changing of billions and billions of people. Um, and once you do accept this free gift of God, which is eternal life, you start to realize Jesus is alive because he's alive in you. You're accepting Christ and he fills your life. And you know that to be true. That, that's the thing about Christians. You can think we're crazy if you want to, but um, you'll hear news people today, oh, you think you're talking to Jesus? Uh, yes, we do. And the Bible says we do that because he's alive today. And uh, it's your job to discern whether what we're talking about is true or false. Can I just say, check your sources? Because the people that are saying, oh, this is all false and you know the atheists, they're on some pretty weak ground, if you ask me. The, the, re the evidence of a resurrected Jesus to me is undeniable and life-changing. Don't miss out on that. Please don't miss out. But if you don't believe me, don't take my word for it. Due diligence. I love the story of Lee Strobel. He, he was a super high level reporter, investigative reporter, uh, one of the top in the world. And his wife was a Christian and he hated that. So he set out to prove as an investigative reporter uh, that his wife was wacko and that Christianity was untrue. But he spent several years flying all over the world talking to all the experts, historians, archeological experts, biblical experts, scholars, and trying to disprove um, the Bible. And it, and it ultimately got down to the resurrection of Jesus. And, it, and when it got down to that, he could not deny it. And he ends up, this major cynic ends up becoming a believer in, in Christ. And he wrote a book about it called Case for Christ. If you haven't read that, uh, it's worth reading because a much more scholarly guy than me actually went through all the exercise of trying to get down to the bottom of this. Don't miss this. If you're a Christian, you get to go away. I don't know about you, but I love talking about this. Our resurrected savior, we have a reason to be joyful today. Wouldn't you agree with that? Amen. Man, Lord, we're so thankful for the joy that we have knowing that we get to go to heaven. This is as bad as it gets for us, Lord, to be on this earth, uh, going through this life. But we look forward to the time where we're with you. And we know that's possible because of a resurrected savior. But Lord, for those who don't know you or have never accepted you, would you, Lord, save souls even right now? 
Would you prompt the hearts of those skeptics and maybe even those that are, who are dragged here by their friends to come to church who don't really know, but maybe they sense the truth of what I'm saying. I pray that you'd soften their heart, that they'd accept and believe. If you would, Christians, just be in prayer and continue to pray with their heads bowed. If you're one who's saying, Brett, I'd like to consider that, to accept Christ and believe. You know, some of your arguments, well, I don't like the church and I don't like Christians. Yeah, that's not what it's about. Uh, that's nothing really about what it's about. What it's about is a bunch of us who are wacko, weird, messed up people. We were saved by God's grace because we accepted the free gift. How do you accept it? Romans 10, verse nine and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a free gift. And you accept it with confession and belief. If you'd like to do that, I'd like to help you with that. I'd like to pray a prayer of confession of faith right here and now. I won't embarrass you or ask you to do anything other than just pray a prayer with me. But it's gotta come from your heart and, and through belief. And you say, well, I don't know if I have enough faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And we've been preaching the word this morning. You've been hearing what the Bible has to say about Christ resurrected. And if you're saying, I'm tempted to believe in that, uh, can I just say, believe and accept and receive? And the Bible says, you will be saved. If that's you, would you acknowledge that? While well, everybody else's head's bowed, would you acknowledge that need and that desire if you wanna accept Christ uh, just by looking up and give me a quick wave so I can see? I just wanna acknowledge you just between you and me and the Lord right now. Uh, I'm just gonna look around for a second. I don't wanna miss anybody. Awesome, awesome. Way in the back, I see you back there. Cool, and you, good, good, good. And you right there, you guys back there, cool. Over here, cool, gotcha. Anybody else, don't let me miss you. Over here, you guys, awesome, awesome. I'm gonna say this prayer of, of faith and uh, I'm gonna ask the whole church to pray this out loud. We love praying with you guys. But if you pray this to the Lord, he hears this from your heart and he'll, he'll honor this and he'll give you the gift of salvation. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus, that he died on the cross for my sins that he rose from the grave and that I'm forgiven. Help me to walk with you. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, would you wrap your loving arms around these people who've just confessed their faith in you? May they know um, uh, just the reality of salvation. And I pray that they'd have that relationship with you now, that they would know you're a living risen Savior. Bless them. Lord, for all of us, we go rejoicing in so good of news of a gift of salvation. We're thankful. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.